Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you to genetics. In this session, we're going to continue the theme of revisiting Mendel in the sense of looking at situations where it seems or it apparently looks like results that we've gotten don't really go along with what Mendel said. But as I think you're beginning to, to find out, Mendel's principles do always hold. So in this section, we're going to talk about gene interactions, epistasis, and modified Mendelian ratios. So this is a recognition that while, as you're going to see in a moment, sometimes when you do crosses, you come up with these ratios that look on the face of them nothing like they should if Mendel was correct. And again, we ask ourselves the question, wow, does this invalidate Mendel's rules? in these organisms or under these circumstances? Or is there another way we can look at the whole thing so that it falls into the Mendelian scheme of things? And it's always true that it falls into the Mendelian scheme of things one way or another. So let's take a look at a couple of terms. And it's very important to understand not only the terminology, the name of it, but what, what we mean by it. So. A very important term here is called epistasis. And epistasis often will, it's not the only thing, but it will often lead to these modified Mendelian ratios that we're going to be dealing with in a moment. Now the word epistasis means, or I should say epistasis happens when one gene interferes with the expression or action of another non-allelic gene. So before we go on, let's just make sure very sure we know what we mean by the term non-allelic gene. It basically just means this. For all of the traits we've looked at so far, the trait is controlled by one gene, or I could say one locus, right? If it's flower color, it's the P locus, where you can have big P or little p. If it's height, it's big T or little t. It's one gene that is affecting or determining that trait. With respect to epistasis, there are actually two different genes. If you were to draw it out letter-wise, in other words, one gene may be the A locus, where there could be the big A and the little a allele, just as an example. And then a totally different gene called B, a different locus, where there could be the big B and the little b allele. We've seen this before. It's just that in the past, these two different non-allelic genes tend to control two different traits, like one was flower color and one was height. In this case, you still got those two separate non-allelic genes, but now they're somehow working together in a sense to determine one phenotype. So epistasis uh, means particularly it's not an even sort of contribution, that one gene is sort of determining, controlling, interfering, however you want to say it, with the action of another gene. And between the two of them, we take both of what they're doing, we take what they're both doing into account. That's how we can figure out what's going on with the phenotype. So as I say here, it can produce all sorts of variations on the Mendelian theme. And we want to, this is sort of the most simple example of a general phenomenon referred to as multifactorial inheritance. In fact, usually when you hear multifactorial, the implication is that sometimes there's uh, 20 or 30 different genes involved in a trait. And also, it can imply that there are some environmental aspects as well. In other words, it's, it's not one simple factor. If you remember, I know I told you we weren't going to use this term again. But Mendel called the genes factors. So multifactorial means more than one gene and even sometimes more than one uh, gene plus some other influences going on. This is simple with respect to multifactorial. In fact, it's two factors acting here, but two is, is multi in the most simple form. So to be very clear, in the versions that we're looking at, this means that two different loci, two separate non-allelic genes, are involved in determining the phenotype of one trait. Now, the two genes assort independently. The way they go through meiosis, etc., it's total independent assortment. So what we have to do is keep the genetic uh, format 
of what Mendel was doing, but try and understand how the different ways the genes are acting are coming together to allow these ratios to occur. Now, one thing that you have to be clear about, if you're dealing with two loci, and if you did a cross in the form that we're used to doing it, in other words, we've often done a double, when we were talking about dihybrid crosses, we did a cross of the form big A, little a, big B, little b, times itself, right? And we found that when we did that, because of independent assortment, we got a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, right? So what I want you to very definitely keep in mind, memorization is important sometimes, but if you understand this, you'll be able to apply it to new situations, and often that's what you're asked to do. So the, the weird, if you will, ratios that we're about to see can always be understood as some variation of the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio as long as we're doing the crosses in the same general format. Once you understand it, you'll be able to extend that to other formats. So in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, just to be clear, genetically the 9, the 3, and the 3, and the 1 are, remember, the nine are individuals in which there's at least one big A and one big B. In this case, uh, complete normal dominance is what's taking place. It would get really complicated if we threw in some of the different dominance relationships that we've discussed. So for now, we're going to go back to just regular complete dominance. So nine have one big A and one big B, and phenotypically they will look uh, dominant for both traits. Remember, in this case, we're going to show that it's only one trait, but traditionally we're used to two. One of the threes has one big A and two little b's. One of the threes has two little a's and one big b. And the one is always homozygous recessive at both loci, right? Keep that general form in your mind, please. I beg you, okay? So let's look at one of the most interesting uh, and, in my experience, prevalent types of uh, crosses and questions that can be asked on an exam or even off an exam. So here's an example with sweet peas, and sweet peas are actually a different species than regular peas. So, but you can see why this would have been startling to the people who did this experiment. So we're gonna do the experiment in a similar way as Mendel did, and what I mean by that is we've got a, in the parental generation, a true or pure breeding purple flowered plant, and a true or pure breeding white flowered plant, right? Now, if this was the Mendelian world, I'm sure when they first did this experiment, they said, okay, well, it's probably just like regular peas. So this would mean big P, big P, right? If it's pure breeding, this would mean little p, little p, if that's pure breeding. Then if the cross, the F1, would be all purple flowered plants, and that's what they saw. So, so far, everything was smooth sailing. What would the genotype of all these be? They'd all be big P, little p, right? They're heterozygous. So, so far, everything's, as I say here, as expected. But it's in the F2. Remember, the F2 is we're going to cross these two. And by the way, I'm writing these genotypes in. They're not correct. It's as if we were thinking of a Mendelian model. This is what we'd be expecting. And what would we be expecting in the F2? Wouldn't we be expecting that traditional 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white? Sure, I mean, you don't have to, I think, by now, but you do a little Punnett square. If these were the genotypes, we would get a 3 to 1 ratio. But it turns out, look what we get. We get, in the F2, a 9 to 7 ratio of purple, 9 purple to 7 white. Now, you can do all the mathematical manipulation you want, 9 to 7 is never going to turn into 3 to 1. They're just completely different. And yet, they did this over and over again and determined that it really is a 9 to 7 ratio. You can't even reduce 9 to 7. Um, 9 sixteenths are one way, purple, and 7 sixteenths are another way. How can we possibly explain this? Well, I wouldn't dare to say that it's easy, but I think... Once you get the hang of it, you'll understand exactly what's going on here, and it will not be totally mysterious, I hope, at least. <music>